Weeks after the 2023 general elections, political parties are enmeshed in series of crises, creating instability and unrest among members. And intrigues as reps plot revolt against APC's zoning arrangement and choice of candidates. This is Plus Politics. I'm Mary Anaka. The 2023 general elections may have come and gone, but the aftermath of the keenly contested polls is still being felt across the land. Winners and losers emerged in the process, even as some contestants uh, doubting the credibility of the electioneering exercise have since filed petitions before the election petition tribunals across the country. Now, of the 18 political parties certified by the Independent National Electoral Commission to enter the contest, only a handful justify their registration status in terms of their electioneering outings, especially the governing All Progressive Congress, the major opposition People's Democratic Party and the Labour Party, won many assembly seats, House of Representatives and Senatorial seats, in addition to the impressive outings in the governorship election. Now, apart from the big three, the All Progressive Grand Alliance, Young Progressive Party and the African Democratic Congress also made some impact. However, a few weeks after the election, some of the parties still have been enmeshed in different crises. Some are deep as threatening to tear the parties apart. To discuss this with us, we're being joined by two political analysts, Ambrose Igboke and Shegun Shopitam. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Good evening, Nigerians. Great. Uh, uh, let me start with you, Ambrose. Um, the senior advocate of Nigeria, um, Michael Zekome, was speaking recently to the Punch newspaper, and he made reference to the fact that one of the, the major issues uh, that causes crisis uh, in political parties right after the election is because that part of, or that time after the election is, according to him, a time of loot sharing. Um, and that is why we see, um, you know, a lot of people at the helm of affairs and political parties going at each other's throat. Um, what do you make of this statement by Michael Zekome? Well, I think Michael Zekome is, uh, has been a participant in electioneering himself. Uh, he was, he was, I think under the PDP, he contested one election in a two state. But I beg to differ with his, uh, the erudite uh, lawyer uh, because, um, first of all, there won't be a lot of bickering if the processes or primaries in the political parties are, are credible, are transparent, and are devoid of some intrigues that we see playing out. Uh, the bickerings always start from not having level ground or fair play among contestants for primaries in the political parties. Uh, so that is what, first of all, most of, if you find out some of the grievances, uh, being tailored uh, by, in the tribunal, you will find out that most of them are pre-election matters. Many of these things are pre-election matters, bordering on who is the rightful candidate of a political party, who was wrongly, um, you know, outsmarted in the political process for the primaries. Uh, the looting, or whatever he called the looting, is uh, usually, um, you know, during... Um, Swear so, uh, after the uh, government have been swearing, or now that a, a president elect or governor, uh, a governor's elect have been declared, that is where you now go to a people lobby to get political positions and all that, and then to see who can be appointed for different uh, uh, for positions. But ultimately, I think the, the bickering always comes from the fact that some members of the political parties feel aggrieved that they were not given level playing ground. Some of them were. You know, you unanimously even forced out of the party. Some of them were refused the chance to even pay for party forms. Some of them were screened out unjustly. And so all these things uh, come to play. Um, the, some of the political parties, the party hierarchy, just, you know, unilaterally impose candidates on, on the political party and call it primaries. So because of, uh, you know, the grievances by political uh, party uh, members, most of them now go to the tribunal, you know, 
fighting the outcome of their primaries, first of all. And then there are also the other opposition party who face trust change in the electoral process, also challenging uh, the um, uh, INEC and then the winning party. So I think it is more bothers not on loot sharing. It bothers more on the fact that the processes that throw up candidates in the political uh, primaries of political parties and then the processes that throw up elected candidates, even in the general elections conducted by INEC, are the basic problems why there are grievances. In both processes, we are free, fair, credible, and transparent. People will pick up the phone and call the winners. But because there are always issues in terms of transparency and credibility, that is why such grievances are much. So that is the pain of the problem. Mm. So I don't subscribe to the part. Why is not sharing maybe some infinitesimal part of the problem? The major problem is lack of transparency in the electoral process. Okay, Shagun, let me come to you. Again, quoting the senior advocate of Nigeria, he says, and I quote, Nigerian politics is Amala politics, uh, come and chop politics. Uh, ours is politics and not and democracy of stomach. Politicians don't practice democracy here. All they look out for, according to him, is how they have their hands in the till. But let's go back to what um, Ambrose just said. Not being able to get the processes um, from the get-go. Why do you think this has con continuously eluded us, um, even in our um, so many years of nascent democracy? Well, um, thanks, Miriam. Um, I tend to agree with um, Azeko Men, uh, Frank, the, the, the uh, acclaimed lawyer, uh, with some of his assertions, you know, uh, especially with regards to the motivation. What, what exactly is it that motivates uh, the actions of a, a larger percentage of our politicians? You find that invariably and ultimately, most of them are driven by personal interests rather than the common good. Um, so to that extent, I would agree with him. Um, but having said that, then to answer your question, uh, you know, one of the other things that we do have as a problem as a country is the, 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 um, the might is right uh, philosophy, if you like. The fact that impunity is, 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 is a culture for us as a country. And that speaks to what my colleague has just uh, talked about, in part, in that um, a lot of our political parties, a lot of the political actors, the leadership of these parties, um, driven by personal interests rather than the national interest or the common good, tends to pursue agendas, tends to pursue intrigues, calculations that will further deepen and entrench their hold on power. And in so doing, they will do whatever it will take, including flout um, laws of the land, flout the rules guiding their own party and the conduct you know, of the affairs of such parties, and so on and so forth. So invariably, you find that uh, people in power generally, in fact, whether they are politicians or otherwise, people in power generally in Nigeria will tend to um, conduct themselves in a manner that suggests that they think that they are above the law and uh, whatever they do, they'll find a way to wrangle it through. And, you know, going back to what uh, Barrister, you know, uh, or Zekome said, I think he also needs to remember and look in the mirror, look at himself and his colleagues and the role that they play in, in how these events tend to play out. You know, because what the politicians do is that they do, they deliberately do the wrong thing they deliberately ignore the provisions of whatever laws or rules that are guiding their conduct, knowing fully well that uh, to secure, to overturn those decisions in court can be very challenging because they would have, you know, the support and the, and the uh, if you like, connivance of members of the judiciary, whether at the bench or at the bar. You know, so I, it's easy for him to speak about the Amala politics, but maybe we should also talk about Amala jurisprudence. You know, so for me... Um, I think the challenge we have is, as, as a country, we need to continue to fight for a situation where people in power can be held accountable by the people they are governing or that they are ruling over. You know, uh, the more we lean in that direction, the less that we have these types of situations that will eventually then throw um, 
um, you know, the, these parties and these associations and these groupings into crisis upon crisis. You know, crisis. If you Google, if you go on Google and just say APC crisis, it's so laughable that you always find every year there is one crisis or the other in the APC. Every year, year in, year out, election cycle after election cycle, there is a crisis in the PDP. Even the Labour Party that has just, you know, recently gained national prominence is already embroiled in crisis. And if you look at, you know, the underlying issues, you find that it will not be too far away from the fact that people will just stand up, make a pronouncement that is completely unreasonable, that is completely out of variance with the provisions of the constitution of those parties. And then, you know, they go about and parade themselves in whatever manner that, that, that they choose, knowing that overturning those actions can be very difficult in the court of law. So these things are fundamental to the way our society works, and we need to, you know, we need to continue to fine tune, you know, these things. Let me go, come back to you, Ambrose. Now, barely a week after the presidential elections um, and, and national assembly elections, we saw um, the APC national vice chairman Northwest, um, Saliu Lukman, um, calling for the resignation of the party chairman uh, and also hinging his demand on the need for religious balance in the power sharing you know, uh, equation. And this has dragged on for so long. There has been calls for a meeting to be held um, so that these issues be dealt with. And don't forget, we're getting ready for May 29. Um, for the ruling party, I mean, the PDP had its fair share of drama just before the elections. Uh, many would even tie their loss to, you know, some of the internal wranglings. But looking at the ruling party and this thing that they have to deal with barely a um, few weeks before the elections, do we see it fading into the background or not? Well, I think that, that call is, uh, at, for the best, uh, I would say, is unreasonable. Uh, it is uh, a distraction. Uh, while we are trying to focus on what the new government that we enter has for Nigeria. For example, the constitution of the cabinet, policy direction, um, the vision, mid-term visions, short-term vision, mid-term visions and long-term visions of, this, of the incoming administration, how to reposition the economy, how to get out of the uh, huge and humongous debts uh, debacle that is hanging on us, both internal and external debt, how to restructure uh, the production sector, uh, how to improve the, our exports, and uh, what, how to do to reduce uh, capital flight we have, especially through the exportation of crude oil and bringing it into uh, Nigeria's refined product. So there is, there, there's a lot to be done. So this kind of distraction is not what we need. Uh, the uh, gentleman who is uh, uh, shouting uh, horse now was there when the APC went ahead to do a Muslim Muslim ticket. Where was he uh, then? And where was he when, where was his voice when people spoke against uh, such an arrangement? So I think we are past that level. APC have done what it wants to do in terms of uh, the non, uh, 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 you know, sticking to the agreement of um, ethnic or religious balancing in the power architecture of Nigeria. Uh, so we are past that stage. The elections have been done. The elections have been won and lost. Uh, great parties are already in the tribunal. So we wait for the outcome of judgment. But as of now, we have a winner that is declared by INEC. And so bringing out this kind of thing is not what we are talking about. People are already talking about how to look at into the issue of, um, uh, will I say, you know, in, uh, trying to um, apportion slots for different geopolitical zones in terms of power sharing arrangements. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at power sharing arrangements on a national scale. Mm. How to, who is going to be the Senate president, which zone is it going to come from the House of Representatives, the Secretary uh, to the Federal Government, all these power structures so that you have a fair representation of the regionality, ethnicity, and religiosity of Nigeria. Uh, so he should not be talking about uh, his party issues right now. That is not what Nigerians are interested in. Uh, we should be focused on, on how to unite the country. Because uh, this uh, last election was uh, a divisive one. Over, uh, in fact, we are having a lot of divis uh, division uh, in, among the various ethnic group, uh, groups and religion. And it was religion was played more than uh, national policies. And this is very bad for the country. I mean, see the example of what is happening in Sudan. Even the, Sudan played that card. For a very long time and even after that you know they separated the country and gave independence to each according to religious uh, leaning 
we can see that the war in the north con has continued. So it is not a, a question of religion. It's not a question of ethnicity. It's not a question of um, where we come from. It's actually a question of our mindset, just like my colleague said. Our mindset is fixated on the negative. I don't know why. So we don't have a national ideology. We don't have a national ethos that we can key into. We need that. Mm. We, you know, when, when, when you go to the United States, for example, Example, there's a national ethos. Serious countries like Britain, serious countries like even Ghana here, they have national ethos. Mm. For example, we say America, this American first. It's a national ideology that drives every citizen, that drives every sector and institution. We, we need that kind of ethos. If we don't have it, then all we're going to be doing is just uh, moving around, cycling, movement without motion, uh, mm. motion without movement. And then we'll just be spinning around like uh, a papa's chair. We're going nowhere. So this is the time to remain focused. And we plead with politicians not to uh, throw up all these kind of frivolities at this point in time, to allow us uh, focus. They should go and solve their internal party problems. I don't uh, disturb the national discussion at this stage. Hmm. Uh, that is a submission I want to all the politicians to embrace. And if I may just talk a little about Amala politics, I think all of us are eating the Amala at the, at the level that it will be. Uh, just as my colleague said, the, the judiciary also. In fact, after election, it is time to, it's, to prepare a huge bowl of Amala. They see it as business. These are judiciary. You see a lot of lawyers now that will become multimillionaires because of election uh, petition issues. So this cycle continues after every cycle, every, and that much we must look into. Uh, in terms of party, uh, party funding too, people, individuals form political parties in this country. And that's what has been causing a lot of issues. They sort of see it as an investment, as a business investment, and, and not for altruistic, national, nationalistic reason. No. When somebody keys in billions of naira for an election, he expects reward. And that is what it causes a lot of the problem. So party funding is very, very important. How election uh, uh, petitions are also funded are very, very important. If mm. we don't get this roots and cost analysis right, then we are, not, we are not going anywhere. So ah. it's the time to look into how we conduct our election, how our parties are funded, and the outcomes of this, so that we can go back to the drawing board and see uh, how we can redirect our footsteps to the right path. Interesting. You, you, you literally went into the area of my next question to Shegun, um, because, you, you know, Every time we talk about how we play politics in Nigeria, the issue of ideologies always creep up. And you, you gave some explanation to me. But Shagwa, I, I want to ask, um, the role of ideologies uh, in Nigerian politics, because you know, if you ask now, there is none whatsoever. Um, I mean, our democracy, as nascent as it is, we keep saying that it's still a growing democracy. Have we not come of age where we can start defining um, you know, the ideologies of the different political parties as opposed to making promises or using logos to differentiate these political parties. Uh, just like Ambrose said, in different parts of the world uh, and countries that are poster childs for, you know, democracies, we see um, the Green parties, the independents, the Republicans and the Democrats. And, and in the UK, you have the Tories and, you know, the Labour, you have the Lib Dems, and you have all kinds of people, and, and they have ideologies, clear-cut ideologies, um, that make them stand, um, you know, unique, uh, that stand out, and, and of course, helps people to decide where they want to go. In Nigeria's case, it looks like it's, uh, it goes to the highest bidder. And quickly, to add to what Ambrose said, he talked about party funding. Um, there is the new electoral act that's been amended. There are rules and regulations as, it's, as opposed to a cap when it comes to the funding of political parties. But yet, it's very difficult to get political parties to make public their accounts and for us to know who's funding and who's not funding. If we're unable to get all of these things in place, how ready are we to really have free, fair, and credible elections? Well, um, look, on the question of ideology, we are, we're a long way off. And my guess is that we may never get there. Uh, I know that that might sound fatalistic, but you know, for me, the, 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 the fundamental problem and the, the, the real, the, the fundamental reason why parties lack ideology, especially in, 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 in our recent experience, maybe in the earlier years of our, of our national journey, you know, in the 60s, for example, you could say that there was some sort of ideology guiding 
you know, the practice of politics at that time. But you see, there's a correlation between the decline in the ideological leaning and the ideological bent, ideological foundation of these political parties, and an increase in corruption in our society, uh, and the centralization of power. You know, the, 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 the fact that we moved from this regional thing and eventually, thanks to the military, we ended up with a unitary system of government where all power resided in one human being at the center. You see, leaning from that and leading from that, ideology was bound to die. Because, you know, the, the, the point behind an ideology is to say that as a human being, I, I stand for something. And I would like to see that thing that I stand for promoted in the national um, um, in the national space. So, for example, I could say that I'm a capitalist by by nature, or I'm a socialist by nature, or maybe I'm even a communist, you know, and so on and so forth. And then, because I'm a capitalist, I would like to see a situation where my country allows free market, free enterprise to drive national development. Uh, if I was a socialist, I would say, no, 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 no. You can't leave, you know, the national uh, development question to the free markets. It will never work. No, you have to take responsibility for the welfare of the people. So the state must be big. The state must be well-funded. The state must do this and that to further the interest of the common man and protect the most vulnerable in society. You know, that would be the things that would be driving the political actions of our political actors. But in Nigeria, what we've found is that the further away we moved, you know, from uh, um, um, uh, representative governance and moved into unitary style of governance, the more we moved into corruption and the more the motivating factor for our political actors became their personal interest, their share of the loot. So ideology is completely useless when my objective in, of, of going into office is to enrich myself, where politics has become um, the fastest way to personal freedom, financial freedom, rather than a call to serve. In other parts of the world, what you find is that majority of the people that, that go into politics are successful already in private enterprise. They, they have done well, they have succeeded, they have excelled, they have, they have shown what they are capable of doing, and then they say, no, I want to serve my people with all of this you know, skills that I've acquired. In Nigeria, it is exactly the opposite. So you find a situation where the worst amongst us who are able by some means or the other to walk their way into the corridors of power are the ones that lead us and their objective is simply to make themselves rich. So ideology will die. Therefore, it will be easy for me to jump from the APC today to the PDP tomorrow, to Labour Party, to NMPP and any other party as long as that vehicle will guarantee my access to the root. You know, and I think that this is the fundamental thing. So, first of all, before we can get to a situation where party ideology is returned, where parties are wrong based on, based on some sort of um, shared common um, I, I, ideas amongst the, the players, you would have to, to devolve powers. You would have to make public office unattractive. Right now, it is simply too attractive to get into power. I will do whatever it takes, including shove ideology down, you know, <laughs> into the darkest recesses of wherever I can hide it. Mm. Because the, the, at the volume of resources that are simply available to me as a president or as a governor just makes ideology completely pointless. So if I am a governor and I have access to one billion naira, Miriam, one billion naira, for example, every month that I do not, by law, need to account for. What, what ideology are we talking about? If I'm, as a president, I have security votes running into billions of dollars every year. What ideology are we talking about? We need to fix our governance structures, our governance systems, before we can now begin to talk about our political systems and our political structure okay. that will ensure that the best of us, people that are thinkers, people that have philosophies, you know, are the ones that will emerge you know, into the national space. Talking about the party funding issue, it's, it's still, you know, revolving around the same conundrum of um, impunity and all of that. Look, how how can INEC um, uh, monitor party funding, funding sources as provided for in the Electoral Act when INEC itself is either under-resourced 
or completely compromised at all times by the political actors who have captured the state and captured the resources of state and therefore have a war chest that nobody can resist, that the court cannot stand against. You know, So we have fundamental problems that have just uh, boxed Nigeria into a corner and put us in a catch-22 situation that is very difficult to extricate ourselves from. You know, So for me, it will take some visionary leader to emerge who would say, you know, with courage and stand and tear down these structures and these machineries that have been put in place to capture the state by political actors. Until that day, okay. we continue to, you know, we just continue to try our best. All right, we have just one minute, and I'm going to give this one minute to Ambrose. Ambrose, quickly, looking at what's happening in the PDP, uh, as we know, um, there's an acting chairman uh, for the party um, who took over from IU. Uh, his name is uh, Damagum. Now, with Damagum, who's a Muslim and a Northeasterner, sitting at the helm of affairs, do you see peace returning to the PDP anytime soon? The Shakespeare book called Macbeth. PDP has murdered sleep, and PDP has sleep no more. The PDP got it wrong. On site of preparation for this 2023 election, the PDP enthroned this uh, power rotation among the North and the South in the presidency. And when it was now turn for the PDP to make a bold statement, having had eight years of Northern leadership in the presidency, the PDP had it that the presidency should naturally revolve to the south. But what did the PDP do? The PDP started playing to the gallery. The PDP started maroling and dribbling our collective uh, uh, sense of uh, you know, equity by saying they threw it open, whatever that means. They threw the presidency open when the presidency was naturally supposed to come to the south after it not has had eight years. And so they threw it open and see what happened. They produced the northern candidate. And that was what really, really upset the Apple Cat and PDP. And they may not be able to recover from, from this by merely changing the national chairman of the PDP. Okay. That is not the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter was that a particular principle that they brought into the national political language was being truncated by the very people that brought it in for very selfish reasons. Okay, and we have to go. At the end of the day, the, the, the deal has been done, and they cannot recover from it just by nearly changing the national chairman. Well, uh, all that will happen within the PDP remains to be seen. But I want to say thank you, uh, Shegu Shopita and Ambrose Igboke, are both political analysts. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for doing justice to this topic. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. All right. Well, we will take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about the intrigues amongst the House of Representative members following the decision by a Senate uh, senator to pick who would be heading, of course, uh, the committee uh, in the National Assembly. Stay with us.